Sophia lecture for microbiology. Uh, this would have been for the lecture for Thursday, um, January 25th. I'm actually a day late, sorry about that. Um, and today we're talking about viruses. So uh, chapter six is an introduction to viruses. And uh, what we'll be talking about is um, understanding the position of viruses on the biological spectrum. Uh, we'll talk about virus structure and go over the different structures within the different type of viruses. Uh, then we'll do some taxonomy, so we'll understand the classes and names of viruses. <coughs> and then we'll understand virus multiplication. We'll see how different viruses multiply within the host cell. And then we'll talk about how to culture viruses, and we'll talk about the different classes of medically important viruses. And then we'll talk about how different viruses are treating, treated uh, when viruses infect the body. So there's always a question on whether a virus is alive or dead. Is it um, living or is it inanimate? And um, usually we describe a virus as an infective particle. Um, a virus cannot live very long outside of a host cell. And so we refer to it as an infectious particle. And rather than calling it alive or dead, we usually refer to it as active or inactive. And an active virus is uh, one that can invade a host cell and actively divide. An inactive virus um, cannot invade a host cell and cannot actively divide, okay? And it turns out that um, a lot of our own genome is comprised of viruses. We can see the uh, adenovirus subunits within our DNA, and scientists believe that upwards to 90% of the human genome consists of sequences that originated from viruses. So, uh, like we've said before, DNA is rather fluid, and DNA can integrate into the genome, even of humans. And so in this case, viral DNA has integrated and given us our own genome, okay? And if we look at the properties of viruses, um, they are obligate intercellular parasites, the parasites of uh, bacteria, protozoa, algae, plants, and animals. Uh, so they can really infect anything. Uh, they're ubiquitous in nature. Um, and they've had a major impact on the development of biological life. And even, you know, if we could go out into uh, the dirt in Simpson in University and just pick up a piece of soil, we would see millions of virus particles. Uh, we've isolated viruses from the soil at Simpson University campus. We found some unique viruses. It's very easy to find viruses that are unique in nature. Um, just because the environment is just full of them. Um, they're very small in size, all sub-micron. Um, the smallest ones are 20 nanometers and they range up to 450 nanometers. Smallest viruses would be like the hepatitis uh, A virus, or hepatitis B virus, excuse me. And the largest viruses would be something like smallpox, okay? And they're, they're not cells. They don't have a prokaryotic or a eukaryotic cell structure. Their structure is very compact and economical, um, consisting of a protein coat, a nucleic acid core, and sometimes an, uh, some type of envelope. Uh, and they do not independently fulfill the characteristics of life because they need a parasite in order to divide. Um, <clears throat> They're inactive outside of the host cell and active only when they're invading a host cell. That's when they can hijack the protein production machinery of the cell and divide and replicate. And just the basic structure of all viruses consists of a protein shell, which we call a capsid, and the protein shell surrounds a nucleic acid core. Uh, the nucleic acid can be either DNA or RNA, but you would not find both in a virus, uh, especially an inactive virus that has not invaded a cell. Uh, the nucleic acid can be double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, 
single-stranded RNA or even double-stranded RNA. And we'll talk about those different classifications of viruses and how they divide and replicate. Um, each one replicates in a unique fashion. And then um, they have little spikes, glycoprotein spikes on this virus surface. And those gain entry into host cells. Uh, they're highly specific because they match the receptors of host cells. And by matching the receptors, then they're able to attach and then invade the cell. And they multiply by taking control of the host cell's genetic material and start to synthesize new virus particles. Uh, and assembly the virus assemble the viruses uh, before the host cell lysis or the host cell bud to uh, release the new viruses. Um, they do not have enzymes for most metabolic processes, and so you find that their metabolism is very simple. And they lack the machinery for synthesizing proteins, so they have to take the nucleic acid, invade a cell, hijack the, the, that machinery. And from that point, then reassemble new viruses and move on. Okay. So if we see just the simple viral components, we start out with the virus particle. Um, there's a covering to the virus particle, uh, which includes always a capsid. The capsid is made out of protein. And then sometimes an envelope. The envelope is donated from the host cell from the um, host cell cell membrane and not all viruses have an envelope uh, and then the central core consists of nucleic acid molecules that would be dna or rna and then matrix proteins um, that are not found in all viruses the matrix proteins are enzymes that just hold together um, the nucleic acids and will um, excuse me, matrix proteins hold together nucleic acids. Enzymes are responsible for digestion of cellular components to allow entry into the cell by the virus particles. Okay, and here's two different types of viruses. On the left, we have a naked nucleocapsid virus, has no envelope, and you'll see the nucleic acid core inside, and then a almost spherical capsid uh, made out of multiple capsomers, each one of those triangles we call a capsomer. And then at the corners of the capsomers, there's a glycoprotein spike. And these spikes help the cells gain enter, or the viruses gain entry into the host cells. On the right side, we have an envelope virus that has basically the same structure on the inside with the nucleic acid and the capsid only it has an um, envelope around it, has a double membrane that was donated from the host cell. And then the spikes, instead of being on the corners of the capsomers, are in the envelope uh, itself. And the spikes then help the cell gain, in, or help the virus gain entry into the host cell. Okay, so if we break this down, we'll start out with the capsid. The capsid is formed of capsomers, and these are individual proteins, subunits, that will self-assemble within the host cell to form a finished capsid around the nucleic acid core. And there are two basic shapes for capsids. The first one is helical, so it will look like a long cylinder. Um, there are several different viruses that are helical that we'll look at their shape in later slides. And then another regular shape is icosahedral, which is um, a 20 uh, sided um, uh, structure that is symmetrical and is made of capsomer triangles. Okay, and a helical capsid will form a continuous helix and will form directly around the nucleic acid. Icosahedral capsids um, will uh, also envelop a helical uh, nucleic acid, but will have more of a spherical structure. An example of the helical capsid would be the tobacco mosaic virus, influenza, measles, and rabies. Okay, and here's a helical capsid. You can see multiple capsomers will form discs and then the nucleic acid will wrap around the inside of the discs, will attach. 
then form a helix, and then the capsid begins to form a helix around the nucleic acids. Okay, here's a helical um, uh, capsid, a nucleocapsid, and an enveloped, um, uh, uh, enveloped membrane around the capsid. And here's a helical capsid that uh, has no envelope around it. Uh, looks like little grains of rice in the photomicrograph. Okay. Icosahedrons are 20-sided uh, figures with 12 even space corners. Uh, they can be um, all a single capsimer unit, all 20, or there can be multiple types of capsimers, which would be encoded by different genes on the virus nucleic acids. Uh, the capsid mostly appears spherical. Some can appear even cubical. Okay, and this I believe is poliovirus, and you can see the different capsimers here have made the 20-sided uh, capsid, icosahedral capsid. Okay, and this is just a protein structural diagram where each capsimer is made out of a different protein. Okay, and then there's a third class of capsids. So we've talked about helical, icosahedral, and then the third class is complex. And this may have multiple types of proteins, and it generally takes shapes that are not symmetrical. Uh, and this includes mainly the bacteriophage. These are virus particles that infect bacteria. And so here you see ico icosahedral head, or similarly, it's not exactly icosahedral, it's a little less complex. Head contains DNA, and then the mechanism below the collar and the sheath the base plate and the fibers, all are just machinery to inject the DNA, not the capsid, but just the DNA, directly into the host bacterial cell. The base plate attaches directly to the cell membrane. The tail fibers orient the virus, so it will be able to inject the virus DNA into the cell membrane, or through the cell membrane, excuse me. Then, like I said before, not all, but some viruses have a viral envelope. And this is some type of membrane, and the membrane is taken directly from the host of an animal cell. Uh, this can be from some type of endomembrane that um, uh, encapsulates an organelle, or it can be directly from the cell membrane. And this happens exclusively in animal cells. You wouldn't find this in viruses that infect plant cells or in phage. Okay, and the virus, once it um, hijacks the membrane from the host cell, will um, eject the membrane proteins that were previously there from the host, and it will replace them with its own membrane proteins as a cell recognition function. Uh, the glycoprotein spikes protrude from the envelope and attach the virus uh, to the new host cell when it invades the host cell. And envelope viruses are shapeshifters. They're pyomorphic, so they can have multiple shapes and um, can take on multiple shapes even in the same virus. <coughs> and there, here are two different viruses. On top is a envelope virus. Um, with glycoprotein spikes, you see the glycoproteins. And then you also see the um, helical capsid on the inside. And then below is an envelope virus with a polyhedral capsid, uh, the 20 sided capsid. Um, and you can see that the nucleic acid is within the capsid. Uh, the nucleic acid is not helical, it just takes on an amorphous shape. And then the glycoprotein spikes, there are many different types of glycoproteins uh, within this particular envelope virus. Okay. And the function of the capsid in the envelope is basically to protect the nucleic acid uh, when the virus is outside of the host cell. And for example, if you take an enteric virus, this would be a virus that affects the intestines um, and goes to the stomach. The virus um, 
nuclear uh, nucleic acids are protected by the envelope and the capsid, and this makes them resistant to protein digestion enzymes like uh, pepsin in the stomach and trypsin in the and chymotrypsin in the intestines. Okay, and the capsid and envelope will bind to the cell surface with special the nucleic acid, or excuse me, the protein spikes, and these have specificity for the cell receptor proteins. And this will assist the cell or the virus in penetrating um, the cell, so the viral nucleic acids will be injected into the cell. And certain proteins in the capsid, the immune system has been trained to recognize those, so that will stimulate the immune system and start the attack against the virus. <coughs> um, viral nucleic acids. Um, can be DNA or RNA, but not both. And um, compared to the genome of even a bacterial host cell, the number of viral genes is quite small, uh, with only four genes for hepatitis C, which is among the smallest viruses, or hundreds of genes for the herpes virus. And the smaller the number of genes, the more this particular virus will rely on host cell proteins in order to assemble its nucleic acids, its capsids, and uh, then eject from the cell. Uh, Single-stranded DNA viruses are parvoviruses. Uh, rheoviruses are double-stranded RNA. Uh, Single-stranded RNA viruses that are ready to translate into protein will go directly into protein. They're called positive sense RNA viruses. And negative sense RNA viruses must form complementary RNA, uh, so they must be converted by RNA polymerase before they can be translated into protein. Okay, so just to give different uh, relevant DNA viruses, we have envelope viruses on the left, which include pox viruses and herpes viruses. And then uh, non-enveloped on the right, where we have double-stranded uh, DNA adenoviruses and Popova viruses. And then the single-stranded genome is just one single uh, group of viruses called parvoviruses. As far as RNA viruses, it's more complex. Um, so you have enveloped and non-enveloped. You have single-stranded. Um, genome that are segmented and non-segmented, and then single-stranded genome that re encodes reverse transcriptase. So with reverse transcriptase, that virus can actually make its own DNA within the cell, uh, actually within the nucleus, and then the DNA will hide in the nucleus, will actually integrate into the nuclear material of the cell, and this includes namely retroviruses. So you really need to know retroviruses for the exam. Um, because they do encode reverse transcriptase, they can uh, create DNA to hide in the cell, and that makes them more insidious. And among the retroviruses, most importantly, is HIV. And this is a retrovirus that um, causes the syndrome AIDS. And so you um, have more difficulty treating and getting rid of viral particles because the viral particles are actually integrated within the host cell themselves. Okay, non-enveloped viruses, we have single-stranded and double-stranded genomes as well. Okay, and to look at how we classify viruses, uh, there are three orders, uh, 73 families, and 287 genera of viruses. And mostly we talk about the genus or the common name for the virus, uh, you know, for measles virus. We just call it measles virus. We don't uh, necessarily call it morbilla virus. Um, and for tobacco mosaic virus, which infects plants, we call that um, tobacco mosaic virus, not uh, tobamo virus. Uh, and I show this just as an, as an example. You don't need to know the different um, orders of viruses. Uh, this is not a self-explanatory table. It doesn't talk about the difference between the different orders, so I wouldn't worry about memorizing those. 
in terms of how viruses multiply. And in, uh, in this discussion is going to be specific to animals. The plant virus multiplication um, uh, schema is a little more complex and it's outside the scope of this course. So first we have adsorption. And adsorption is when the virus attacks the surface of the host cell. It's different than absorption. Absorption means that something absorbs inside. Adsorption means that something is just attached to the surface. Then after adsorption, the viral host, uh, the viral will, uh, virus will uh, invade the host cell, will actually penetrate the cell membrane. And then once in the cytoplasm, the virus will uncoat, it will get rid of its membrane, and it will get rid of its capsid and expose the nucleic acids. Then once the nucleic acids are exposed, uh, then the host cell machinery will start to synthesize new virus particles, RNA in the cytoplasm and DNA in the nucleus, and will also translate proteins that are required for uh, capsomers and capsid assembly. Uh, then after the components have been synthesized, then they will be assembled into virus particles. And then they'll be released from the host cell either by lysing for non-envelope viruses or by budding through envelope viruses where the envelope will actually be donated from the host cell. Okay. And this is a really busy slide. Uh, I apologize, but it shows the um, replication of an RNA virus. And here we've got a virus with glycoprotein spikes. Let me get that bigger here for you. So we have a virus with glycoprotein spikes. These spikes are complementary to the cell surface receptors. And so the virus binds the cell surface receptors uh, up at um, portion one. And this is called absorption. So the virus takes, uh, attaches to the host cell by specifically binding its spikes to cell surface receptors. And then it penetrates uh, the uh, host cell membrane. And then it goes into the host cell and uncoats. Okay. And so the glycoprotein spikes and the uh, virus coating the uh, envelope will release the RNA, and the RNA then, if it's positive sense RNA, can go directly into making um, new RNA. Uh, if it's negative sense RNA, it has to be converted to positive sense RNA in the nucleus. Uh, if it's positive sense RNA, it can be directly um, uh, synthesized in the cytoplasm. And then it goes to make new uh, capsomers, which are protein, and then new spikes, which are glycoprotein. Okay, lost my arrow. So here's the new spikes. The new spikes will go and replace the glycoproteins that are normally on the surface of the protein, or excuse me, surface of the cell. And then the new capsomers and the new uh, positive sense um, RNA will then go to form. Um, the uh, capsid with the nucleic acids inside. This will bud. Okay, so you see a little bit of budding here where the glycoprotein spikes have now been replaced with the glycoproteins that would normally be in the virus, and then it is released. Okay, and here's just two uh, figures that show um, adsorption where the host cell membrane has complementary uh, sites for binding the envelope spikes. Okay, and here's capsid spikes. These are non-envelope viruses, and the host cell membrane has compatible sites here. So the host cell thinks that it's um, giving access to some type of protein or some type of cytokine, but indeed it's giving access to an invading virus. So, and this shows specific attachment versus irreversible attachment. In specific attachment, the glycoprotein spikes 
then directly attached to the host cell membrane. Okay, and then there the host cell membrane engulfs the virus. The virus is encased in a vesicle, and then once the vesicle breaks down, that frees the virus, and then you get free DNA. Um, for irreversible attachment, um, the uh, actual uh, viral envelope becomes a part of the cell membrane. So here you see the receptors are binding the uh, glycoprotein spikes. Uh, they're forming a complex. The capsid is released into the host cell, and then the virus membrane then becomes a part of the cell membrane. And here at the end, the virus membrane is irreversibly put into the cell membrane, so that changes the cell membrane surface. Now, DNA viruses have to enter the nucleus and are replicated directly by DNA polymerase there. RNA viruses are replicated and assembled in the cytoplasm. Okay, and this is a confusing slide, so if we've got positive sense RNA, uh, then it will make a negative sense RNA. The negative sense RNA then can convert to the new genome, and the negative sense RNA then can be read um, as a template in order to make the capsids. Okay, the genome can also be read to make the capsids. Um, and with a negative sense RNA genome, it has to be converted to positive sense. The positive sense is then reconverted to the negative sense genome, or the negative sense, uh, positive sense RNA is converted into negative sense RNA in order to use that as a template for the capsid. Okay. And then if we have double stranded RNA, and then the positive sense RNA is exposed to make more genomes as well as more negative sense RNA that makes the capsomers for the capsid. And then if we have a retrovirus, the RNA, positive sense will make negative sense DNA that will interact with the cell's DNA polymerase to make double-stranded DNA. This will be transcribed into RNA, okay, and the RNA then makes the genome and then the RNA actually makes the capsid uh, that in, uh, encapsulates the genome. And then the uh, double-stranded DNA can then, at this point, integrate into the host cell's genome and then will hijack the host cell and move all around different parts of the body. An example of this would be HIV. Okay. And here's a, this is a smaller figure. I do apologize. Um, and we've got viral DNA. This is a DNA virus where the DNA is entering into the nucleus. This the large purple portion down here is the nucleus. Um, this is translated to viral mRNA that leaves the nucleus and interacts with the ribosome to make virus proteins. Virus proteins then go through the nuclear pores to make capsomers. Okay. And then the uh, replicated, um, here we've got the double-stranded DNA, okay? This makes single-stranded DNA, then to make more replicated DNA viruses. This can integrate into the host DNA directly, or then it can go to make more virus particles. And here we've got the capsomers and the nucleic acids for the virus. Those assemble into mature viruses and then are released by the nucleus. Non-enveloped or complex viruses are released when the cell lyses or ruptures. So as the cell breaks apart, but then <clears throat> it will release uh, capsid viruses and complex viruses like phage. Envelope viruses are liberated by budding or exocytosis, and the membrane from the cytoplasm um, or the nucleus or the endoplasmic reticulum or the vesicles then can be donated to be the envelope for the virus. Okay, and here's an example of budding where we have the host cell membrane and we have the capsid and the RNA making a mature RNA virus. 
okay, uh, viral matrix proteins then line the cell membrane and the nucleic acids will align with the matrix proteins. This will start to bud and now the viral glycoprotein spikes are in place rather than the cell surface receptor proteins. This budding virion then becomes a free infectious virion or virus uh, with an envelope. And here's an example of budding down below. <clears throat> now, most viruses um, are benign, so they we can enter and exit cells without any damage. Uh, but virulent viruses will have some type of cytopathic effects. Uh, and this is some type of damage that will alter the cell's microscopic experience, exper uh, appearance. Excuse me. Um, you also will see cells form inclusion bodies uh, as it's fighting against viruses. So these are compact masses of viruses or damaged cell organelles. Um, and they're uh, put in inclusion bodies in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. And then you'll see because the cell membrane is so damaged, it will start to fuse with nearby cells. And so you'll have multiple cells that are fused together. Uh, by the viruses, and these are called syncytia, and they just look like large single cells with multiple nuclei. Okay, um, here's a group of muscle cells with virus particles in the muscle cells. You can see the cells are forming inclusion bodies here in order to hold damaged organelles, and there's a virus in there as well. And here is a large syncytia, it has many nuclei in it, and it's just a cytoplasmic mass and the nuclei are, are surrounding it. Um, and this is an example of syncytia. Okay, and then to talk about viral infections, they're more insidious and they're more difficult to treat than bacterial infections. Um, they can last a few weeks like influenza or for something like hepatitis uh, B or C. They can last the rest of the lifetime of the patient. Um, latent viruses like chickenpox can remain in the cytoplasm of the host cell for a long periods of time. And this is opposed to proviruses that will actually integrate in the DNA of the host. Okay. And so when the virus DNA actually goes into the DNA of the host, and this is for um, a disease called roseola, which causes sort of a bright red cheek appearance. Uh, you see a lot in infants and toddlers, and the provirus will actually integrate into the host cell, and that makes it much more difficult to fight. Okay, and um, if the virus lays dormant for a long period of time, like chicken pox, which can become shingles later in lifetime, then we call that the chronic latent state. Um, it's inactivated, uh, and it will be activated later on in life, uh, flare-ups due to stress. This is also true of hip herpes uh, simplex 2, where it will just lay dormant, and then some type of episode that involves a sickness or stress or something else will cause the latent dormant or the dormancy to end, and then the virus will flare up. Okay, here's an example of roseola. Uh, it's just a red rash. Uh, this is predominantly on the body, although the, one of the characteristic features is the rash on the cheeks. Okay, here's a herpes virus on the vagina of a patient, and so you can see very painful lesions here. Okay, uh, and this is uh, shingles virus, uh, and the shingles virus is from chicken pox, and it occurs after a patient has had chicken pox or the chicken pox vaccine and it occurs later in life okay uh, there are viruses that can cause cancer these are generally retroviruses and they contain oncogenes and the oncogenes will in invade the nucleic acids of the cells and then they'll start to make oncogenic proteins that can cause cancer um, retroviruses uh, will um, include viral oncogenes like the uh, cell to the left. They can also disrupt cellular function and uh, turn on cellular oncogenes um, and those will exist in a provirus state. 
and then some DNA tumor viruses will just inject their viral DNA and that will remain in the nucleus but will be independent of the chromosomes. Okay, and that leads to uncontrolled growth of the cell. Now, virally transformed cells actually become immortalized. Uh, one of the things that we do in the lab quite frequently is we'll use something like Epstein-Barr virus, and that can immortalize host cells. Uh, we take mammalian cells, infect them with Epstein-Barr virus, and then they'll have an increased rate of growth. Uh, you see some alterations in chromosomes, so the chromosome number is um, is no longer diploid, but you'll have uh, some some chromosomes that are triploid. So you'll have alterations in chromosome size, alterations in chromosome number. Uh, the cell surface molecules will be changed as the cell is preparing to make more virus particles. And then the cells are able to divide over an indefinite time period. Usually with mammalian cells, if they're not virally transformed, they may divide outside of the body for maybe 10 passages. So you get 10 good cell divisions, and then the cells just die in some mess. Uh, however, when they're virally transformed, especially with Epstein-Barr virus, then they will divide for an indefinite period of time. And over that indefinite period of time, then you can use the mammalian cells for uh, different types of experiments. Okay, uh, these include uh, uh, papillomavirus, uh, which is also called HPV, uh, which certain forms of HPV are responsible for cervical cancer, uh, herpes virus in the case of Burkitt's lymphoma, uh, and then hepatitis B virus in the case of liver cancer. When the hepatitis B virus invades the liver, then the cells become transformed, they rapidly grow, and then that forms cancers. Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about viruses that infect bacteria. We call these phage, uh, and these attach to the bacterial cell wall and will invade the bacterial surface. Most are double-stranded DNA, but there are some single-stranded uh, DNA and RNA forms. And certain forms of um, uh, bacteria are more virulent uh, because they've been infected with phage. The phage donate the virulence genes to the bacteria. And so there are some medically relevant phage that without it, the bacteria would not be infective to humans, but with it, it be, the bacteria becomes highly infected. Okay, and here is um, phage invading a host. Here's the E. coli host up here. It's the phage kind of looks like the lunar module from the Apollo missions, but it donates its DNA. It injects its bacterial DNA into the host, or the viral DNA, excuse me. The viral DNA then will create duplicate phage components, and then the phage can be assembled okay into new virions okay and so all the different portions of the phage are resident within the cell so it will make the entire bacteria phage inside the cell the phage will mature and then the cell will become weakened and lice and that will release the viruses so it can infect new bacterial host cells now another thing that can happen is that the viral dna can integrate into the um, into the bacterial DNA chromosome, okay, and that becomes a prophage. It's not a provirus. A provirus is not a phage. It's not a part of the phage assembly. A provirus is uh, not for bacterial cells. It, it does in, integrate into the host cell in the same way, uh, but a prophage is not a provirus, okay. And some sometimes the uh, viral DNA will split and will form a new type of uh, plasmid within the bacterial host cell. And then that can go on and replicate, or sometimes it can just splice, okay? And when it's spliced, then it becomes what we call a prophage, okay? And we have T phage, T phage specifically invade E. coli. Uh, T even phage include T2 and T4. These have an icosahedral head. 
uh, with a docking mechanism to deliver DNA. And the docking mechanism directly squirts the uh, viral DNA directly into the host cell and it eliminates the need for the virus to uncoat inside the host cell. And then the parts of the host cell self-assemble to form new phage. Okay, here's the type of T even phage and you can see that it's docked up against the bacterial cell wall. Um, the different spikes allow for orientation, allow for attachment to the cell wall, and then the viral nucleic acid simply just secretes out into the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, and here are a lot of T-even phage. Each one of these little particles is a phage particle. You can see the docking mechanism on the host cell, and you can see that this host cell is already invaded with many, many phage, and these phage are being self-assembled. So pretty soon this cell will lyse and release its phage particles to go and infect other cells. Okay, and when a cell is lysogenic, uh, means that the phage doesn't uh, readily undergo replication or release immediately. These are phages that uh, uh, do not multiply rapidly, but they're more temperate, so they take longer to divide. Okay. And when the phage DNA is uh, inserted directly into the bacterial chromosome, we call that a prophage. And so this state, a prophage state, we call lysogeny when the viral DNA is incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. And that allows the virus to spread. Every time the bacteria divides and replicates its chromosome, then the virus is dividing and replicating as well. And the host cell is not killed. It's just uh, has a new DNA incorporated into its chromosome. Okay. In human disease, we'll see that these bacterial chromosomes that have affected phage or that have, um, uh, that have um, incorporated phage into the chromosome will cause the production of toxins that are more phage toxins, not bacterial toxins that are pathogenic to humans. Okay. And so when bacteria acquires a trait from a phage, we call that lysogenic conversion. And this would be like botulism toxin, Botox, is actually not from Clostridium botulinum. It's actually uh, contributed by a phage. And the phage is just when botulinum has divided, the phage is divided along with it. And so when you find Clostridium botulinum in nature, it already has the phage DNA within the chromosome, uh, but this was incorporated long ago. Uh, diphtheria toxin, also from Clostridia, uh, diphtheria and vibrio cholerae, which causes cholera, um, all have been converted lysogenically. And so it's the phage DNA within the, the bacterial cells that is causing the toxin that is uh, making these diseases so insidious. Okay. Uh, now in the laboratory, we cultivate uh, viruses uh, readily, uh, but they need a host cell. They do not cultivate on their own. And so what we do is we isolate and identify viruses uh, in clinical specimens. Um, we could then prepare the viruses for vaccines. A lot of viruses that infect humans have been made into vaccines. Um, this would be like rabies virus, measles virus, chickenpox virus. Uh, we can also do research on the viral structure, the multiplication cycle, the genetics of the virus, and the effects on the host cell. Okay, and a lot of times in order to make antibodies against these viruses, we'll inoculate live animals, uh, primarily mammals, because the antibody structure of mammals is so close to that of humans. And so we'll look at white mice, uh, rats, hamsters, guinea pigs, and rabbits. Uh, we'll inject the viruses directly into the peritoneum of the animal, and then we can um, sacrifice the animal and get the antibody producing cells directly from the spleen of the animal. Okay. Occasionally you'll use insect cells. Uh, insects make a form of antibody that is different than humans, uh, but you can use that to replicate viruses. And sometimes you use non-human primates more as, um, as research animals to see the effects of the virus. Okay. 
And to replicate lots and lots of viruses, uh, bird embryos, uh, the eggs provide a closed, protective, um, almost sterile case. And the embryonic tissue then will allow the virus to propagate. And a lot of viruses that are used for vaccine development are made in bird embryos. So you'll see um, large quantities of eggs being incubated, and each egg is incubating a virus. Okay. And you'll see that um, the virus can be injected into different places. Uh, the um, Corio Allen toy membrane is for herpes simplex virus, pox virus, uh, Rouse sarcoma virus, which is a cancer virus, uh, the amniotic fluid around the egg embryo or the chicken embryo is used for influenza and mumps, uh, the yolk sac for uh, herpes simplex, and allantoic uh, can be used for influenza. This is outside the amniotic sac. Um, and mumps, Newcastle's disease, which is a vaccine that is used for chickens and avian adenovirus. Okay. And to culture these cells, uh, we can grow animal cells in a monolayer culture like you would grow in a tea flask. Uh, these could be primary cells. Uh, they're the first round of culture after the cells are taken from the animal. Or they can be continuous cell lines. Uh, but you have to bear in mind in continuous cell lines that after the cells are grown through several passages, they may be virally transformed and they will definitely be altered in terms of chromosome number and morphology. And now flu vaccines are routinely made in animal cell culture and insect cell culture where they used to be routinely made in uh, chicken embryos. Okay. Uh, the infected cells form lice and they'll form viral plaques. Uh, the viral plaques are just areas of clearing in the animal cell or in the insect cell. And here's the Petri dish and you can see it's got a confluent layer of cells on it. Uh, this actually happens to be bacterial phage, and where the phage are starting to replicate and form cultures, and then you see these zones of clearing, and these zones of clearing are teeming with viral particles that are infecting the bacterial cells around them, okay? So if we were wanting to culture viruses, then we would specifically pipette out the fluid in the regions of clearing, those plaques, and we would get lots of virus particles, okay? Uh, medically important viruses uh, would include um, those that cause prominent viral infections like dengue fever, Rift Valley fever, yellow fever, uh, rabies and Ebola, which um, outside of uh, very, very drastic medical intervention are nearly always fatal. Uh, those that cause long-term debilitation or can cause long-term de debilitation like some forms of polio or neonatal rubella. And incidentally, it's important to know that polio itself um, is only, uh, it usually 94% of the patients have no symptoms whatsoever. So they're carrying around the polio virus, they're spreading the polio virus in their feces, but they have no symptoms whatsoever. It's just a small slice of the population, about 6%, that has any type of infective effects and an even smaller slice that would uh, actually go into paralytic polio. Okay, uh, here's an insect uh, vector that is passing along donkey fever or Rift Valley fever. Okay, and here's a, a patient with hepatitis and you can see hepatitis uh, with the liver produces a lot of bilirubin that gets into the bloodstream. And then the patient, uh, because the bilirubin is yellow, the patient appears jaundice. Okay, this is neonatal rubella syndrome. And you can see that this baby has cataracts uh, in their eyes. Okay, and that's a, um, one of the common defects in congenital rubella syndrome. You can see the cataract right there. Okay, so that baby was born with cataracts because their mother developed rubella during pregnancy. Now, we're going to take a departure here, 
and we'll talk about a different type of infective particle. We never refer to prions as being alive. These are proteinaceous infectious agents, and they actually will recruit other proteins by transmitting a misfolded state in proteins that causes disease. Uh, the most prominent in humans is crutchfield jacobs disease, which is the human variant of mad cow disease, and it causes uh, central nervous system damage and death in humans. It's a lot like Alzheimer's disease, but the progression is much faster. And we also know of bovine uh, spongiform encephalopathy, which is mad cow disease. And when a mad cow is isolated, then typically everything around that mad cow for one mile radius will be burned. So any other animals within the herd will be sacrificed. Any plants, anything, any foliage would be burned uh, for one mile radius. Um, and that is because it's very difficult to get rid of prions. They're very difficult to decontaminate. They're the hardest thing to decontaminate, the hardest infectious particle, even uh, more difficult to decontaminate than um, bacterial endospores. Okay, and here's a figure that shows how prions are replicated. And you'll have non-prionic proteins up here in green. And then they'll interact with the prionic protein. That protein will recruit the non-prionic protein, okay, by transmitting a misfolded state. It will actually fold up against this protein, cause this protein to misfold, so they're both prionic, okay? Now, the things that's, that's insidious about prions is that they can spontaneously also convert into a muta mutated state, so these green proteins can just spontaneously become prionic, so you don't necessarily need to be infected with a prion in order to get a prion disease. And then these prionic forms will um, multiply. And when they multiply, uh, then they'll spread prionic disease. <clears throat> uh, normal proteins we call PRP superscript C for control. And prionic proteins we call PRP SC, which is uh, SC stands for scrapie, which is a prionic disease that invades sheep. Okay. Other types of infectious viruses or infectious particles include satellite viruses. And these will go along, they'll actually replicate in cells that have already been infected with viruses. So they can only invade virally infected cells, like uh, the adeno-associated virus will only infect cells with adenoviruses. Uh, the delta agent, which uh, will only infect cells that have been uh, invaded by hepatitis C, will cause hepatitis C to be more damaging. And then you have viriods, uh, which are single-stranded RNA. They're extremely small. They have no protein coat. It's just an RNA particle that will infect plants. Um, and they're very, very difficult to treat. Um, and in terms of antiviral drugs, there are very few on the market. It's something that's very difficult to treat, but they will target some portion of the virus's life cycle. Uh, azithromycin or AZT is a nucleic acid analog, and it will actually bind HIV, and it will bind where thymine would normally bind in the nucleic acids and it will block DNA elongation after the retrovirus has converted the virus to DNA. Once AZT incorporates into the DNA of the cell, then it can no longer or no further uh, elongate because AZT is an analog of thymine, and, but it has no covalent bonding for the next nucleic acid. Okay, and um, integrase, Inhibitors, uh, these are protease inhibitors, will prevent HIV from entering into the host cell. So HIV will just circulate in the bloodstream, but it won't be able to invade a host. Okay, and then there are interferons that are proteins. Uh, these are naturally occurring human proteins, and these will signal the immune defenses and beef up immune defenses against viruses. These are produced recombinantly, and so you can get megadoses of interferons through recombinant drugs. And when you do that, then they have side effects of nausea, also uh, fatigue, 
Uh, so patients only get interferon very rarely, maybe once every week or once every two weeks if they're suffering from something like hepatitis C. And that concludes our video, or concludes our video. Uh, this is the only video that we will do uh, for this lecture. So even though this is not quite an hour long, uh, this will suffice for the video lecture until we meet on lecture for lecture on Tuesday next week.